Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Battleship Bismarck, part 12. As early as the beginning of May, the British noted an increase in German aerial reconnaissance in the far north and over Scapa Flow. The commander-in-chief of the British Home Fleet, Admiral Sir John Tovey, suspected that this activity portended another German surface operation in the Atlantic. His first precautionary measure was to instruct the cruiser Suffolk, which was patrolling Denmark Strait, to keep a sharp watch for a possible German attempt to break out. At the same time, he ordered the cruiser Norfolk, flagship of the commander of the 1st Cruiser Squadron, Rear Admiral W. F. Wake Walker, and then, lying at the base in Iceland, to relieve the Suffolk as necessary. In the early hours of 21st of May, Denham's report of the sighting of 11 German merchant ships, two large warships, three destroyers and five escorting vessels on a northwesterly course in the Kadegat reached Tove aboard his flagship King George V at Scapa Flow. He immediately attached great significance to this report and began speculating as to what ships were involved, what they were up to and what was the purpose of the reported merchantmen. The Admiral thought of Bismarck, of whose recent trials in the Eastern Baltic the British Intelligence Service had kept him advised. Naturally, he could not be certain that she was one of the large warships sighted, but it seemed wise to base his plans on the assumption that she was. If it turned out that his assumption was false, well, so much the better. Tavi and his staff worked out four possibilities as to what might be the mission of the reported combination of ships. 1. The warships were escorting a supply convoy to Norway and when the latter reached its destination, they would return to Germany. 2. The warships were escorting the merchant ships to the north in order to use them for replenishment during their own operations. 3. The warships were escorting the merchant ships northwards in preparation for a landing in Iceland or the Faroes for which they would provide cover. And 4. The warships were escorting the merchant ships only as a secondary mission, their prime one being to get out into the Atlantic. All these mental gyrations were brought on by our purely accidental meeting with some merchant ships at the entrance to the channel through the Skagerrak minefield. Since the last of the four hypotheses would be the most threatening to him, and at the same time the one that Germans could most quickly implement, that is what Tavi prepared for. He reckoned that any measures he took to counter that threat would be bound to serve as some defense against a landing in Iceland or the Faroes, if that was what the Germans intended. But which of the five possible routes to the Atlantic would they choose this time? There was the Denmark Strait between Iceland and Greenland, which in May was narrowed by pack ice from 200 nautical miles wide to probably 60 nautical miles. The passage between Iceland and the Faroes, 240 miles wide, the passage between the Faroes and the Shetlands, 140 miles wide, the Fair Island Channel between the Shetlands and the Orkneys, and the narrow Pentland Firth between the Orkneys and the coast of Scotland, which for practical purposes could be counted out. After carefully weighing the pros and cons, Tavi concentrated on the Denmark Strait but did not ignore the three more southerly routes. At his immediate disposal were the battleships King George V and Prince of Wales, the battlecruiser Hood, the heavy cruisers Suffolk and Norfolk, eight light cruisers including the Galatea, flagship of the commander of the second cruiser squadron, Rear Admiral ATB Curtis, and twelve destroyers. Upon receipt of Denham's report, the Admiralty also assigned him the aircraft carrier Victorious and the battlecruiser Repulse. The Prince of Wales and Victorious had been in commission for only two months and were not fully combat ready. Tavi at once deployed his ships to meet the situation. He ordered the Norfolk and the Suffolk to patrol the Denmark Strait together rather than alternately, sent three cruisers to watch the passage between Iceland and the Faroes and divided the rest of his force into two task groups. The Hood and the Prince of Wales under the command of Vice Admiral Lancelot Holland, the King George V, the Repulse and the Victorious under his own command. In the midst of all this planning, the interpretation of Suckerling's photography arrived. So it was Bismarck after all. It was actually Bismarck and a hipper class cruiser in the fjords near Bergen. Torvi's hunch had not played him false. The same evening he sent Holland's task groups and six destroyers to watch the passages into the Atlantic, especially those north of 62 degree latitude. In order to avoid wasting fuel on superfluous searches, he decided not to take his own group to sea until it had been determined that Bismarck and her accompanying cruiser had left Norway. He then had almost 24 hours and anxious waiting because the bad weather of May the 22nd was a great handicap to British aerial reconnaissance as it was an advantage to the German ships, which that day were steaming across the Norwegian Sea. 
Late in the afternoon of May the 22nd, a plane left the Orkneys on a daring, low-level reconnaissance flight across the water and over the hilly coast of Norway. That evening, Tavi got the report he wanted. The German ships had left Norway. At 2200 hours, he put the sea on a northwesterly course to cover the breakout route south of the Faroes. Winston Churchill cabled President Franklin D. Roosevelt. It read, Yesterday, on the 21st, Bismarck, Prince Eugen and eight merchant ships located in Bergen. Low clouds prevented air attack. Tonight, they had sailed. We have reason to believe a formidable Atlantic raid is intended. Should we fail to catch them going out, your navy should be able to mark them down for us. King George V, Prince of Wales, Hood, Repulse and aircraft carrier Victorious with ancillary vessels will be on their track. Give us the news and we will finish the job. At midnight on May the 22nd, as British and German forces converged on the northwestern passages into the Atlantic, it is interesting to compare the premises on which the two commanders were basing their actions. Tavi had had the German task force identified, knew it had left Norway and anticipated that it would try to enter the Atlantic through the Denmark Strait. Lütjens knew that the opening stage of Exercise Rhine had become known to the enemy. The several signals he received from Goob North on May 22, however, led him to believe that his northward passage had not yet been detected and that most of the British home fleet was still concentrated at Scapa Flow. It should here be pointed out that Lütjens, his staff officers and the diaries of both the fleet and the ship having been lost in the Bismarck on May the 22nd, the considerations and estimates that determined tactical decisions after we left Grimstadfjord on the evening of May the 21st cannot be known for certain. Neither the surviving turbine engineer, Captain Lieutenant Gerhard Junak, nor I, in charge of the aft fire control stations, knew what was going on in the minds of the fleet and ship commands. Like everyone else, we could follow closely only the events that took place in the immediate vicinity of our duty stations. All we knew about Exercise Ryan was that Lindemann had told the ship's company over the loudspeakers on May the 19th. Even such basic matters as the route we were planning to take and where we might stop, being components of a secret operational plan, were not made known to the junior officers ahead of time. Fähnrich Hans-Georg Stiegler, who was doing a petty officer's duty in the engine's internal command and communications post and assigned to the aft E-group, received his own sample of secrecy. On an off-duty stroll around the ship during the passage through the Kadegat, he reached the chart house, where his classmate Friedrich Wilhelm Dusch was in process of tracing the ship's course. Just don't look at the chart, Dusch shouted at him. That's all secret. But Stiegler had already noticed that the ship's course was plotted to the Norwegian fjords and thus obtained information that far exceeded his need to know, but resolved to keep it strictly to himself. Lütjens taciturnity probably ensured that deliberations at his level were restricted to a very small circle anyway. Finally, the fact that we were at general quarters almost continually from the time we entered the Denmark Strait on May the 23rd until the end of May the 27th made conversation among the officers next to impossible. The tactical conduct of the operation must, therefore, be based primarily on Bismarck's war diary as it was reconstructed from whatever material was available at installations ashore. Obviously, a document so produced cannot be entirely satisfactory because, for example, it cannot show whether the Embark intelligence service team or shipboard radio and listening equipment provided Lütjens information that Group North and Group West did not have and, if so, what that information was. Nor can the reconstructed diary show why and how new decisions brought about by significant developments in the course of the operation were reached. Early on the morning of May the 23rd, in foggy, rainy weather, Bismarck and Prince Eugen entered the Denmark Strait. Around 0800 the wind, which had been blowing from the south-southwest, veered to the north-northeast and thus again came from astern on our new westerly course. Around noon, a new weather forecast from home promised that weather favorable for our undetected passage of the strait would continue on the 24th. It read, Weather 24. Area north of Iceland, southeasterly to easterly wind, force 6 to 8, mostly overcast, rain, moderate to poor visibility. In spite of this welcome message, in the afternoon visibility increased to 50 kilometers, but before long, intermittent heavy snow caused it to vary considerably between one point on the horizon and another. To port, in the direction of Iceland, heavy haze hung over the ice-free water. 
on our bow in the direction of Greenland, there were shimmering bluish-white fields of pack ice and the atmosphere was clear. The high glaciers of Greenland stood out clearly in the background and I had to resist the temptation to let myself be bewitched by this icy landscape longer than was compatible with the watchfulness required of us all as we steamed at high speed through the narrowest part of the strait. Our radar was ceaselessly searching the horizon. We would not have welcomed this clear visibility even if we had not been expecting intensified British reconnaissance. I could not help thinking of the warnings Externbrink had given Lütjens. Suddenly, at 18.11, alarm bells sounded throughout Bismarck. Vessels to starboard. The task force turned to port, but the vessels revealed themselves to be icebergs. Ice spurs and ice flows piled one on top of another frequently led young men, unaccustomed to recognizing objects at sea, to report non-existent ships and submarines. Excusable, but dangerous, because when a man had made several incorrect observations, he might be afraid to report any sighting at all. But that wasn't all. Sometimes the air over the glaciers of Greenland caused mirages that fooled even the old sea dogs. When that happened, the officers on the bridge were liable to see ships and shapes that were not there. Shortly before 1900, we entered the pack ice. From then on, we had to steer a zigzag course through heavy ice flows that pressed hard against the ship's side and could have damaged our hull. In an area three nautical miles wide, visibility ahead and to the edge of the ice to starboard was now completely clear. To port, there was haze in the distance and in front of the haze, there were patches of fog. It was 1922 when the Bismarck's alarm bells sounded again. This time, our hydrophones and radar had picked up a contact on our port bow. I stared through my director but could not see anything. Perhaps the contact was hidden from me by the ship's superstructure. Our guns were ready to fire, awaiting only the gunfire control information. But it never came. Whether the contact was a shadow on the edge of a fog bank or a ship bow on or stern on, perhaps very well camouflaged, we saw it too fleetingly to fire on it. Our radar registered a ship heading south-southwest at very high speed and plunging into the fog. As the contact moved out of sight, the shadowy outline of a massive superstructure and three stacks was discernible for a few seconds. That was the silhouette of a heavy cruiser. As we learned later, it was Suffolk. Thereafter, the hydrophone and radar bearing of the vanished enemy soon shifted astern and the range increased. With exemplary speed, the intelligence service team aboard Prince Eugen deciphered the radio signal by which Suffolk had reported us in the course of her turn. One battleship, one cruiser in sight at 20 degrees, range 7 nautical miles, course 240 degrees. Lütjens reported to Group North the sighting of a heavy cruiser. When shortly afterwards we saw the Suffolk clearly and for some time she was at the limit of visibility. Her small silhouette revealed that she was trailing us astern. There was another alarm on Bismarck at 20.30 hours and full speed ahead was ordered. Our forward radar had made a new contact. Over the loudspeakers Lindemann informed the crew, enemy in sight to port, our ship accepts battle. Looking through my director in the indicated direction, at first I could see nothing at all. Then, the outline of a three-stack heavy cruiser emerged briefly from the fog. It was the Norfolk, summoned by Suffolk, to which we had come alarmingly close. Norfolk had suddenly discovered her alarming proximity to our big guns. Flashes came from our guns, which were now trained on her, and in a moment we could see the splashes of our shells rise around the cruiser, which laid down smoke and turned away at full speed to disappear into the fog. According to the Norfolk's after-action report, three of our five servos, all that we could fire in so short a time, straddled their target. A few shell fragments landed on board, but no hits were scored. Norfolk stayed hidden in the fog for a while, then reappeared astern to join the Suffolk in shadowing us. The word was passed to our crew, enemy cruisers are sticking to our course in order to maintain contact. It now developed that the jolts caused by the firing of our big guns had put our forward radar out of action and, since Bismarck was in the lead, our task force was blind to any threat from ahead. In order to overcome this disability and also to have the ship with the heavier guns near the shadowers astern, Lütjens ordered a number change, which meant that Prince Eugen, her forward radar intact, would take the lead. In the Kriegsmarine number changes were routine evolutions. The ship in the rear pulled out of the line and increased speed, while the leading ship slowed down until the overtaking one had taken her place at the head of the line. 
that was supposed to happen this time, but instead of a routine maneuver, we had a little excitement. Lindemann happened to be inspecting my battle station and asking questions about this and that when he received a report from a talker on the bridge. Hurrying forward, he was confronted with an alarming sight. Bismarck and Prince Eugen were on a collision course. Without waiting to get back to the bridge, he had his orders to the helm relayed, and the danger passed. Thus, the thing we most wanted to avoid an encounter with British naval forces had happened at the very beginning of Exercise Rhine. As I have probably emphasized enough already, such an encounter was highly undesirable because an undetected breakout was so important to the success of our commerce warfare in the Atlantic. We younger officers still did not know what Tavi was expecting us to be in this area and had strengthened his surveillance of the Denmark Strait two days earlier. Nor did we know that there had been no German aerial reconnaissance of the strait since a Focke-Wolf had flown over it four days before, on May the 19th, and had not observed anything unusual. Not only being unaware of these things, but counting on the fact that our departure from Norway was still a secret, this sudden encounter with British cruisers came as a shock to me, especially as it was reasonable to assume that there would be other enemy ships in these rather narrow waters. But at the same time, I regarded it as only an opening act, and naturally, we were confident that we would be able to ward off the threat. Lütjen's next moves were aimed at either shaking off our pursuers or sinking them. Now, the Suffolk and Northolk were both maintaining contact with us from astern and at the limit of visibility. The Suffolk to starboard, where visibility was good, the Norfolk to port, where there were long stretches of fog. Most of the time, I had good view of the Suffolk and occasionally could see them both. Since at least the tip of a mast was always visible on the horizon, it gradually dawned on us that these annoying hangers-on must have better means of maintaining contact than optical instruments. Through dark grey seas and white wave crests, the pursuit continued. At almost 30 knots we sped through the half-light of the Arctic night, through fog banks, rain squalls and snow squalls, every now and again, adding to the cover the elements gave us by laying down smoke. In an attempt to shake off our pursuers, we changed course and sought the shelter of every patch of haze, but it did no good. The British cruisers were continuously informed of our position, course and speed, which they radioed to Tave. Their reports were intercepted by our intelligence service team and in five minutes were laid before Lütjens. They read like a minute-by-minute -minute account of the movements of this task force. This phase of his operation was an open book to Tave. What a depressing beginning for Exercise Rhine. Lütjens decided to take the offensive. Around 2200, under cover of a rain squall, he had Bismarck make a 180 degree turn. He intended to surprise Suffolk by suddenly running out of the squall and attacking her when she came into view. But when we emerged, there was no enemy to be seen. It looked as though the cruiser had seen through our maneuver in time, in any case, she had turned and moved away from us at high speed. For a while we pursued her in the hope of getting her in sight. Then Lütjens gave up, not wanting to be drawn too far back to the east, no matter what the enticement. He ordered Bismarck to turn back and resume her former position in the task force. Suffolk eventually caught up with us, but Lütjens did not take the offensive again. He assumed that it would not turn out any differently and he was undoubtedly correct. We had another excitement when the word was passed, aircraft off port beam. In the far distance, a Catalina flying boat, evidently from Iceland, was banking as it searched the area. Then, apparently unsuccessful, it turned away and disappeared. We could see it clearly outlined against the sky, but for its crew, the grey hulls of Bismarck and Prince Eugen probably blended into the leaden hue of the Arctic Sea. Shortly before midnight, our task force was enveloped in a heavy snowstorm, into which our followers soon ran. Visibility shrank to a nautical mile and the cruiser's signal ceased. On our bridge, the atmosphere was tense. Perhaps there would be no more. Were we to be lucky for once? But the respite lasted only three hours. Lütjens concluded that the British had an efficient long-range radar system, a conclusion that threw his whole concept of surface warfare in the Atlantic into a disturbing new dimension. In fact, only shortly thereafter, Suffolk had had a modern, traversable radar installed, by means of which he could reconnoiter up to 22,000 yards. It was blind only in a small sector astern of the ship, where the impulses were blocked by her own superstructure. Northrop had to get along with an older and less efficient, non-traversable radar. 
Although we continued to hope that somehow we would succeed in shaking off our shadowers, we were haunted by a concern as to what other ships they might have called on to join them. The early morning of May the 24th brought radiantly clear weather and moderate seas. Steaming in the same order as the previous evening, Prince Eugen in the lead, Bismarck in her wake, we were following a southwesterly course at a speed of 28 knots. Below, in the three turbine rooms, a warrant officer, two petty officers and six stokers were on duty at all times. The warrant officer, the senior petty officer and one stoker stood on the control platform. The second petty officer and the other five stokers tended the auxiliary engines and the fresh water generator. Every lever and every control had to be examined again and again to make sure that the 150,000 horsepower propulsion plant was performing precisely as it should. Because of the high steam pressures at speeds, such as we were then making, the slightest error in handling could have catastrophic consequences. And everyone on board sensed that the hours to come would bring great decisions. The watch on the bridge and all the lookouts paid particular attention to the southeastern horizon, from which direction other enemy units were most likely to come. And we were certainly not disappointed. Not long after 0500, the hydrophones in the Prince Eugen picked up ship noises to port, and at 0509, Group North radioed that shortly before 0500, Suffolk had again reported our position, course and speed to Scapa Flow. It must have been around 0545, the rising sun having already lit up the horizon, when the smoke plumes of two ships and then the tips of their masts came into view on our port beam. General quarters were sounded on Bismarck. Through my director, I watched as the masts in the distance grew higher and higher, reached their full length and the silhouettes of the ships below them became visible. I could hear our first gunnery officer, Corvettenkapitän Adalbert Schneider, speaking on the fire control telephone. His hour had come and all our thoughts and good wishes were with that competent, sensible man. A young seaman aboard Bismarck had once summed up his own and his comrades' feelings as such. Next to the captain, the first gunnery officer, Corvettenkapitän Schneider, has all my respect and confidence. Now, I heard Schneider saying he thought the approaching ships were heavy cruisers and giving targeting information on the lead one. I heard our second gunnery officer, Corvettenkapitän Helmut Albrecht, who was in the forward control station, expressing first mildly, then definitely, doubt that the ships were heavy cruisers and saying that he thought they were battle cruisers or battle ships. Then the turrets were trained, the 38 cm guns loaded and all we needed was the fleet commander's permission to fire. Meanwhile, the enemy ships were rapidly closing their original range of more than 30,000 meters. I estimated that they were steaming at about the same speed we were, 28 knots. To approach nearly bow on as they were doing appeared to me absolutely foolhardy. It reminded me of an enraged bull charging without knowing what he's up against. But since the British Admiral obviously knew that, his impetuous approach must, I thought, have something to do with gunnery. Presumably he wanted to close the range rapidly so as to get out of the way of plunging fire. But there was no time to ponder such considerations at this moment. Whatever the British tactic was, the exciting reality was that the ships were getting nearer and nearer to us. The clock showed 0553. The range, I figured, was less than 20,000 meters. Suddenly there were flashes like lightning out there. Still approaching, nearly bow on, the enemy had opened fire. Donnerwetter, those flashes couldn't be coming from a cruiser's medium caliber guns. Certain that we would immediately return fire, I braced myself for permission to fire and the thunder of our guns that would follow. But nothing happened. We in the aft station looked at one another in bewilderment. Why weren't we doing something? The question hung in the air. Schneider's voice came over the telephone. Request permission to fire. Silence. Schneider again. Enemy has opened fire. Enemy servos well grouped. And a new. Request permission to fire. Still, no response. Lutyens was hesitating. The tension laid in seconds stretched into minutes. The British ships were turning slightly to port, the lead ship showing an extremely long force and two heavy twin turrets. On the telephone, I heard Albrecht shout, The hood! It's the hood! It was an unforgettable moment. There she was, the famous warship once the largest in the world that had been the terror of so many of our war games. Two minutes had gone by since the British opened fire. Lindemann could restrain himself no longer and he was heard to mutter to himself, I will not let my ship be shot out from under my ass. Then, at last, he came on the intercom and gave the word. 
Permission to fire. Both the German ships had concentrated their fire on Hood, while she, deceived as our enemies often were by the similarity of design of all our ship types, was firing at Prince Eugen, in a belief that she was Bismarck. The captain of the other British ship, which turned out to be the battleship Prince of Wales, realizing what had happened, began firing at Bismarck, despite Admiral Holland's order to concentrate fire on the leading German ship. About four minutes after the firing began, and after six servos had been aimed at the hood, Lütjens ordered Prince Eugen to take on Prince of Wales, which he referred to as King George V, under fire. Having been ordered to keep our fellow travelers, Norfolk and Suffolk, under continuous observation in case they launched torpedoes at us, I could no longer watch what was going on off our port beam. I had to depend on what I could hear over the fire control telephone. Lindemann's permission for us to open fire was immediately followed by our first heavy salvo. The Bismarck was in action and rumble of her gunfire could be heard as far away as Reykjavik, the capital of Iceland. I heard Schneider order the first salvo and heard his observations on the fall of the shot. Short, he corrected the range and deflection, then ordered a 400 meter bracket. The long salvo he described as over, the base salvo as straddling and immediately ordered Full salvos, good, rapid. He had thus laid his battery squarely on target at the very outset of the engagement. I had to concentrate on watching Suffolk and Norfolk, but I must say I found it very difficult to deny myself glimpses of this morning's main event. The cruisers, still 12 to 15 nautical miles astern, followed on our course a little to one side of our wake. There was no evidence that they were preparing to launch a torpedo attack. Suffolk fired a few salvos, but they fell hopelessly short. Wake Walker and the Norfolk appeared to have left the battlefield completely in the hands of the senior officer, Holland, in the hood. I continued to hear Schneider's calm voice making gunnery corrections and observations. The enemy is burning, he said once, and then, full salvos, good, rapid. The forward gunnery computer room was telling him at regular intervals, attention, splashes. Ever since the action began, I had been wondering whether I would be able to distinguish the sound of the enemy's shells hitting us from the sound of our own firing. With all the noise that was going on, that might not always be easy. Then I heard Schneider again. Wow, that was a misfire. That really ate into him. Over the telephone I heard an even louder and more excited babble of voices. It seemed as though something sensational was about to happen, if it hadn't already. Convinced that Suffolk and Norfolk would leave us in peace for at least a few minutes, I entrusted the temporary surveillance of the horizon astern through the starboard director to one of my petty officers and went to the port director. While I was still turning it toward Hood, I heard a shout. She's blowing up! She. That could only be the Hood. The sight I then saw is something I shall never forget. At first, the hood was nowhere to be seen. In her place was a colossal pillar of black smoke reaching into the sky. Gradually, at the foot of the pillar, I made out the bow of the battlecruiser projecting upwards at an angle, a sure sign that she had broken in two. Then I saw something I could hardly believe. A flash of orange coming from her forward guns. Although her fighting days had ended, the hood was firing one last salvo. I felt great respect for those men over there. And with Hood's A turret firing one last defiant salvo, this is the after action report. This one is going to be a bit longer because a lot is happening. Uh, first off, the Battle of the Denmark Strait has begun one of the most famous naval engagements in history. Bismarck being shadowed by the two cruisers made this inevitable and in the event both Captain Lindemann aboard Bismarck and Vice Admiral Holland aboard Hood must have known that this contact could only have played out in a decisive way. And it did, as you all know, Hood blew up after about six minutes of battle which led, in the space of only three minutes, to the death of 1,415 of her crew members. Only three sailors survived. But what exactly happened? Now, this has long been a matter of debate and there are a lot of documentaries about this battle. Most of them are, however, fiction. It has long been stated that Hood fell victim to plunging fire, meaning that a 15-inch shell from Bismarck came down at such an angle that it penetrated the lightly armored deck of Hood and detonated in the aft magazine. However, this is impossible. Uh, at the time of the engagement, the distance between the two ships was only about 8 nautical miles. 
at this range, since we know the ballistic performance of the German SK-38 guns and their armor-piercing ammo, the incidence of the shell was only about 9 degrees of horizontal, as you can see on screen right now. At this incidence and range, the existing deck armor of Hood would have been strong enough to withstand a hit. So the hit had to have happened someplace else. Currently it is thought that Bismarck scored a hit through the lower belt of Hood, which at the time of Hood's turn was exposed by her bow wave. I find this explanation to be the most plausible as it aligns with the observed magazine explosion. It also was most definitely Bismarck scoring the hit as we know from the crew of Prince Eugen that her fire was switched to King George V at the time. There also happens to be some very famous video footage of the engagement which I will put up again. It was taken from Prince Eugen and you can see the enormous shockwaves of the 15 inch guns surprising the cameraman when it hits him resulting in his jolting of the camera. As Burkhardt mentioned, the battle could actually be heard all the way up to Reykjavik. He later traveled there in 1953 as a diplomat and had a chat with the foreign minister who was in Reykjavik at the time of the battle and he told him that he heard distinct naval gunfire at the time it took place. All in all, from a tactical standpoint, the Germans had all the advantages and they used them. The loss of Hood was a huge blow to British morale, but in the event it strengthened their resolve in sinking Bismarck in turn. Hood herself was a very beautiful ship and I encourage you to watch some documentaries about her glory days. I also encourage you to watch documentaries about one of her only three survivors, Ted Briggs, who will tell you the harrowing account of witnessing the magazine detonation firsthand. Her entire crew shall not be forgotten. On the other side, Bismarck also took damage, three hits in total. One shell hit the seaplane catapult and disabled it, making it impossible to launch the seaplane later. One penetrated the bow and caused some minor flooding, which contaminated 1000 tons of fuel. The third one penetrated underwater and hit some machinery space without exploding, but ruptured some steam lines along the way, which injured some crewmen. Also of note is Lindemann's famous order, after all, it is his ship and his crew, and he has tactical command, and as such, the final word. Superseding Admiral Lütjens as it was, was no insubordination in this case. So, the hood has gone down, but the battle isn't over. King George V is still around, stunned of what just happened. We will see how it commences in the next episode. Until then, like, comment and subscribe. Bye bye. Cheers.